You may be a nice person and do good things, but is that enough? Today, His Eminence Bishop Omega preaches a sermon titled, You Can Always Tell When Something Is Missing. Be edified and uplifted. Peace be unto you, saints, and praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone, to the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. We're going to pick up here with the great Apostle Paul as he it launches on his third missionary journey. As I said again, he went alone. Of course, he was, the Holy Ghost was with him, Lord Jesus. But in terms of persons traveling with him, Paul is alone on this particular journey. And we're going to pick up here at the 18th chapter of Acts, 23rd verse. And it begins, or it carries on this way. After he had spent some time there, there where? In Antioch of Syria. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia, Galatia and Phrygia in that order, strengthening all the disciples. Now there, and pay attention now because we're going to come to this word disciples later, it won't mean the same sort of disciples. First of all, disciples only means learners or followers. So here Paul was strengthening the disciples of Christ, those that he had taught in places where he launched churches or founded churches. And two places that he went to check on, after he had some time off, we might call it a vacation, or a little respite, he had some time off there in Antioch. He picked up again his work and said, let me go check and see that the, those disciples of Jesus in Galatia and Phrygia are still holding to what I taught them. Let me make sure they still have it right. So he launches out to go do that. And the, at verse 24, we'll see it, the, the story sort of switches. It says, now a certain... Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is of, is, of course, today's Turkey. Now, Paul was just in Syria, today's Syria, Antioch of Syria. Now, the story just jumps and says, now we're talking about a man who was in Turkey, in Ephesus, who came to Turkey. But he's from Alexandria. Where's Alexandria? That's in Egypt. So apparently we're going to see that this Apollos was instructed very well in the Old Testament scriptures and he has come as far in his knowledge of the Lord as the preaching of John the Baptist. Now the reason I'm explaining this before we actually read it because when it says in the ways of the Lord you may think that he's talking about the fullness of Jesus and his ministry. That is not the case here. What it is saying is he's been instructed in the ways of the Lord, and he'll tell you, but stopped and was limited to the baptism of John the Baptist, and we're going to explain what that means too. But let me read it first. Now, verse 24, Acts 18. Now a certain Jew, that also tells you that Apollos is not yet Christian, because it didn't say a Jew who has now become Christian or one of the brethren. No, it says a certain Jew, so he's clearly instructed in the way of the Lord as far as the Old Testament scriptures. He is not yet Christian. We'll see when he becomes one. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Egypt in Alexandria. And why Alexandria? Here again, I hate when I get sidetracked like this, but I must give you this for those of you who are history buffs. Because Alexander the Great, of course, when he conquered Egypt, named the city after himself. And when he was down there with, um, what's the famous Egyptian queen and her brother that had the squabbles and Anyway, uh, uh, Cleopatra. She, Cleopatra, most likely is a descendant of some of the Greeks that, that were there as a result of Alexander being there and conquering. So I'm saying this to those of you who get perturbed sometimes when you see sometimes a rendering of, Alex, uh, of uh, Cleopatra as a lighter skinned woman. You say, well, she's Egyptian, she'd have been darker skinned. You don't understand the Greek influence that was in Egypt then. Cleopatra clearly had Greek blood, so it is very likely that she could have looked like the renderings that you see sometimes in modern movies. That has nothing to do with the message, just so we explain a little bit the name there, Alexandria, which is in Egypt, and how the, name, the Greek name Alexandria ended up in Egypt because Alexander the Great went there and conquered, and also left some Greeks left their seed there, some of whom may have been the Queen uh, Cleopatra. Back to the story. That was a bit of a digression. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, which means he spoke very, very uh, uh, clearly 
and very enlightened uh, way of speaking, uh, and he was mighty in the scriptures, which means he understood and knew the Old Testament scriptures inside out very well. He was mighty in scripture. He came to Ephesus, again, today's modern Turkey. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Now, just for a quick understanding of what the way of the Lord means, let's go quickly to Genesis 1819, because it does not mean that he knew anything at all about uh, Jesus as such. He knew that there was a Messiah to come, but the fact that he had come, who he was, that the Holy Ghost came and was like, he didn't know any of that. So he was uh, instructed in the way of the Lord in as much as this is what in the way of the Lord means. Let us go to Genesis. I don't know why I went to Exodus here. Genesis, uh, you want to go to 18, 19. And why are we going here? Just to show what the way of the Lord means. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the, na- I'm sorry, and all, uh, that's, that's 1818, and all the nations of earth uh, shall be blessed in him. Now here's what I want you to hear. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they may keep the way of the Lord. Now, what does the way of the Lord mean? Oh, it means to do righteousness and justice and the, uh, uh, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So do you see that the way of the Lord means knowing what is right to do concerning what the Lord has revealed? So that is what Apollos was instructed mightily in, the way of the Lord, not the way of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything about him. So this is what I said, this is why I said that Apollos was not yet Christian at verse 24, 18, chapter of Acts, when it says, now a certain Jew named Apollos, he was still Jewish, but he was a powerful, eloquent speaker, mighty in scriptures, understood them very well. He was instructed somewhere in Alexandria, Egypt, by somebody who knew the Old Testament well. So he was a a Old Testament believing Jew, but his knowledge stopped. It was limited with the baptism of John the Baptist. By the way, today's title is, You Can Tell When Something Is Missing. You can tell when something is missing. Now, he had a lot, but something was missing. And we'll see with other disciples in this passage that we're using, to, that we're using today. They had the repentance ministry of John the Baptist, but there was something missing. And without me being so obvious and evident, it's clear what was missing. That is the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. But they were yearning correctly. They had the Old Testament scriptures down, Apollos did, and some of the other disciples. But you'll see here in our very next reading where we're going to cover verse 25 right now, you can see he was limited. Listen to this. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He was very fiery in spirit and very much uh, uh, active and alive. Fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, listen to this, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now, that term, the baptism of John, does not only mean the simple submersion into water. The baptism of John is an all-encompassing way of expressing John's message, what it is John preached. And we can break that down if you pay attention, saints, and I know some of you do, and take notes. John's message was encompassed in three primary areas. Very simple, not very long, and I will give them to you now. This is what John's message was. Because John's message is often summarized, and you'll see Paul summarize. Uh, Luke, I should say, summarizes what Paul says when, when Paul refers to the baptism of John. What am I explaining right now? The baptism of John. It doesn't just mean submersion into water. It means the whole ministry of what John preached. The whole message, I should say more accurately, of what John preached. Well, what did John preach? Preach. John preached the ministry or the baptism of repentance. What does that mean? Number one, John's baptism or John's message was that you no longer need to kill animals to sacrifice animals, to show God your contrition. God now is demanding that the heart be repentant. 
So the first thing that John is preaching is get your hearts right, make straight the way, get ready for the coming of the true Messiah. So his point is, number one, you no longer need uh, sacrifices of animals to show God or to demonstrate to God that your heart is repentant. Now God is demanding that your heart be changed, that you, when it says uh, repent, to rethink. This is what John is preaching now. Change your hearts, people. And what is number two? Then do works befitting rep repentance. What does that mean? Produce fruit. Befitting repentance. I believe that's in Matthew, that's alluded to in Matthew 3, 8. He says, essentially, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Meaning, number two, of John's message. First, that you don't need, number, what is number one? You, don't, you no longer need animals. God wants your heart changed. The blood of animals was all a harbinger getting to the one that John is talking about now. He's coming soon, John says. But John says, first of all, show God that you're really repentant by doing it for real inside. And how is that made manifest? Bear fruit. Bear fruit. What does that mean? Live a life that shows you have changed. That's, John, that's part two of John's message. And what's part three of John's message? I'm not the one, John says. John says, yes, I'm symbolically baptizing you in water because you have now confessed your sins. You've told God you're sorry. You've repented. Come here. Let me symbolically wash, show a washing. That's all the submersion into water is. You're, submer you're being submerged into water into John's baptism of repentance because your heart is converted. Now, up out of the water, dry off. Now go live a life that's worthy of that repentance you claim you just uh, uh, admitted to. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. The third thing is in John's message, that all of this means the baptism of John. The third thing is the one that's coming, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. I truly baptize with water. That's symbolic of you washing away sins. Symbolic of you washing away sins. Because we know the Holy Ghost washes sins in earnest. But John says, since your hearts are repentant, come. God has ordained my ministry of symbol symbolisms, of baptizing you into water. But that's limited. That's only the baptism of repentance. But there's one coming after me with power. He's going to baptize you with the Spirit and with power. Why? What does that mean? Well, power to live the life that can produce fruits that's worthy of repentance, that shows you've repented. He's going to give you, he's going to baptize you with the Spirit. That's a different baptism, and we're going to see that later in this passage. But that baptism that the Lord Jesus will bring is the baptism that gives you power to live the life that's pleasing to God. Understand something. You must, yes, start with repentance because your heart has to say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you. Forgive me. John says, great. That's the first part of my ministry, to teach you that. Now that you are repentant, come. Be baptized in water. Ah, but now it goes further. John says, my ministry is limited because the third part of John's baptism, the third ministry, his teaching was that one is coming after me, John says. I'm not worthy of him. I can't untie his, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals, his shoes. But I indeed baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with spirit and with power. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So you see that the Holy Ghost to come was preached in John's ministry, but it was not yet come to be left with mankind. And this is important to note for when we get to our later passage in Scripture today. It had not yet come because the day of Pentecost had not yet come. But John's baptism, the ministry of John, was to preach, to be the forerunner for the one you really need. But you're not ready for him until you repent. So John says, let me get you ready with this ministry, with this baptism of repentance. Change your hearts. Make straight the way. The king is coming. The Messiah is coming. I'm doing this symbolic baptism in water. That can't compare to the power that's coming with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And the one that's bringing that, when he comes, he's going to baptize you with that. Someone will say, well, then why did Jesus get baptized? He had nothing to repent for, but Jesus himself explained it. He said to fulfill all righteousness, meaning 
God the Father ordained the baptism that John brought. Jesus came to not break, but fulfill all righteousness, all the scriptures, all the law, all the prophets. Since John's baptism was part of that, Jesus fulfilled that. He says, let it be that we must fulfill all righteousness. Jesus had no sin to symbolically or actually wash away, symbolically in water, actually through repentance. He had none. But Jesus is saying, this is what God has ordained. Let me show all of you that everyone should be baptized unto repentance. But now, we know this now later, since Pentecost, yes, we should still go down in water because Jesus himself said it as he was leaving. He says, go around and baptize everyone. But now what? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. Meaning, baptized, associated with, identified with Christ Jesus himself. And you'll see that is what was missing in Apollos, and that is what was missing in other disciples of John the Baptist slash and Apollos, who only taught the ministry, the baptism of John the Baptist. It was limited. But we, who have the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we are aware that we should be baptized in water in terms of identifying with that one body of Christ and in terms of being obedient. But we also know that it is the Holy Ghost that washes away sins. It is the Holy Ghost that saves. It is the word of the Lord Jesus that brings you into paradise. Today, you shall be with me in paradise, he told the thief on the cross. That thief on the cross never got down and touched any water. But when the Lord gives you opportunity to fulfill the water baptism, that we should do because it was a commission given to us to be baptized. Now, back to where I was. Verse 25, this man, Apollos, had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. And I just explained what the baptism of John incorporated. It encompassed the awareness that no longer do you need blood, uh, animal sacrifices in order to demonstrate your contrite or repented heart to God. He wants a real repentance of heart. Two, after you have truly repented, live a life that shows fruit that bear uh, fruit that worthy of repentance. Live a life that shows you are repentant. You've changed mind. And three, get ready for that one that's coming to baptize you with the spirit, with the power of God. That's the threefold uh, components of the uh, ministry of John the Baptist. Of the, you know, when it says the baptism of John, that's what it means is all I'm saying. Now he goes on, verse 26. So he, Apollos, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. See there again, you can clearly see he is teaching Jewish Old Testament scripture because he's in the synagogue preaching to fellow Jews who now have become disciples of John the Baptist. It says there, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he went into the synagogue and speaking boldly to Jews, telling them as far as the baptism of John. What does that mean? That means he did not, he was not aware that this Jesus of Nazareth is the one John was talking about, that he had already come, that he has gone up and left the Holy Ghost. He wasn't aware of all that. Now, John's ministry clearly taught that a Holy Spirit was to come and and the Messiah, whenever, whoever he is, whenever he comes, he will bring it. But Apollos was not teaching and it has already happened because he didn't know it. He was down in Egypt in Alexandria and apparently was not aware of the events of Pentecost. He was not aware of the mighty works and ministry of Paul and all the other apostles since Pentecost. Apollos was limited, being away in Egypt and Alexandria, he was taught by some skilled in the Old Testament scriptures, but had not been brought up to date. So he was limited and stopped at the baptism of John, which encompassed those three aspects I spoke of earlier. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So Apollos, being a Jew, went to the synagogue and says, hey, you fellow Jews, you have to catch up. John the Baptist has taught this and has taught this. Now, sitting in the audience, and notice Aquila and Priscilla were still attending the Jewish synagogues on Sabbath, 
When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, how did they hear him? They were in the synagogue. Now, don't forget, they were made Christians by Paul in Corinth. Remember, in our recent sermon, they were converted when Paul first landed in Corinth. Who did he run into? Aquila, who later introduced him to his wife Priscilla. And because they had the same profession, they hung out together. And they went over, to, uh, Paul stayed with them at their house, and they began to make a living together because they were both tent makers. So this Aquila and Priscilla heard this mighty speaker, this eloquent speaker, this man skilled in the scriptures, Apollos, but they notice something is missing. And that, what's today's title? You can tell when something is missing. And this Aquila and Priscilla, now Christians, are hearing this mighty and eloquent speaker, Apollos, but they see that he comes just so far, though he's brilliant in scripture, in Old Testament scripture, all the way up to John the Baptist, not aware of the, the ministry of Jesus, not aware of the leaving of the Holy Ghost and the powerful work the Holy Ghost and the, has been doing through the apostles and all that. Not aware of that, Apollos is preaching left and right. He's doing a good job and he's convincing Jews that, hey, John's baptism, uh, John's ministry and his baptism must be heeded. So uh, Priscilla, Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside, most likely to their home. They took him aside and explain to him the way of God more accurately. What does that mean? Let's just sum it up. They explain to him, all that that you're teaching has been fulfilled in Jesus. Apollos. Now, this is where some uh, women like to say, see, women can preach. No. She was home with her husband, teaching this fellow believer, though he was not fully, a, he was not a Christian yet, but he's yearning right, in the right way. He's one of those Old Testament believers. And they took him aside and explained to him, everything that you're preaching that shall come in the Messiah has come already in one Jesus of Nazareth. You may not know this, my brother, they're telling him, but he has come already. His name is Jesus the Anointed, Jesus of Nazareth. So they explained to him the way of God more accurately. That just means they gave him the full lowdown, what Paul taught them. What Paul taught them in Corinth, in Achaia, back in Greece, Paul, they're saying, this, my dear Apollos, is the fullness of the way of God more accurately. And it involves Jesus the Christ who has come, who has died on the cross, who has been buried, who has been resurrected, went on up into heaven and left that powerful spirit, which you never heard has already come. So now here's how you know that Apollos Convert, uh, when I say converted to Christianity, converted fully to Christianity because he was yearning the right way. But here, and when he desired to cross into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Meaning, verse 27, is clear proof that Apollos said, I get it. This is where we have to learn how to read the unseen. Apollos is saying, I get it. All that I've been preaching that was yet to come has already come? Oh, thank you, Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife. And when he got it down so well, they were so convinced that not only Aquila and Priscilla, but the other brethren Christians now, there, they all wrote and said to the saints in Corinth, in Achaia, they said, receive this brother Apollos. He's now a full-fledged Christian, and he knows what he's talking about. And don't forget, he's a powerful speaker, an eloquent man, fervent in spirit and knowledgeable of the scriptures. But now he can link it all together. That which was missing has now been implanted in him. And you'll remember even Paul himself said, I planted Apollos watered. So Paul uh, later acknowledges that the work that he did in Achaia, in Corinth, Apollos came and enhanced. And here is where you see Apollo gets his shot in the arm, if you will, his endorsement, because the brethren, including Aquila and Priscilla and the other saints there in Ephesus, gave him a letter of commendation, which was common then, to say, accept this man that has this letter. He's a mighty preacher. Accept him. And why did he want to go to Achaia? Well, most likely because they, uh, Apollos knew Paul started the church there in Corinth, this mighty apostle Paul. And Paul converted Aquila and Priscilla. So he wants to go 
to further teach and help wherever he can. Apollos was fervent in spirit, uh, as it says earlier in verse 25, fervent in spirit. So this man, like Paul, is desirous to do work on behalf of the Lord, to spread the word. He says, just give me some letters so they can accept me when I go there, because he was going to go there and enhance the work Paul had already planted. So, and you'll see that Paul says in a certain place, uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul even says, I planted Apollos watered because Apollos helped him to confirm the word Paul had already planted there. So he was a mighty help to the Apostle Paul. And verse 27, and when he desired, Apollos, desired to cross into Achaia, Greece. Remember, that's the province in which Corinth sat. If you will, that's the state or the province that Corinth, the city, sat. Uh, the brethren that were from Ephesus gave him a note, gave him a letter saying, accept this brother, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly, not just a little bit, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, who Paul had already planted the word in. He came there and enhanced it. That's one reason Paul says, listen, don't say I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of this one, I'm of that one. He says, God does the increase. We each have our job. I planted, Apollos watered, God gives the increase. Let us remember that too in all of our particular work that we do for the Lord. Verse 28, for why uh, was he a great help to the church in Corinth, to the church in Achaia, Corinth? He, he was a great help for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is that long awaited anointed one of God, that Jesus is the Christ. So you can see Apollos, once he got straightened out with what was missing through the Lord, of course, but using Aquila and Priscilla, who took him aside, took him home and said, listen, brother, you're preaching correctly, but you're missing something. What's today's sermon? You can tell when something's missing. So they're sitting, sitting in the synagogue listening to him. They're going, this man can speak. Yes, honey, this man can speak. He's powerful, but he's missing the whole thing about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus or he's talking about the Messiah. He doesn't realize that is Jesus of Nazareth who has come, who has died on the cross, who has been resurrected, went on up, left uh, the Holy Ghost for the believers and has uh, in, uh, indwelt all believers with the Holy Ghost. But he doesn't know that. We have to tell him that. Now, once they know and accept and believe that, that will happen to anybody else, as we'll see soon. Uh, happened to other, uh, other disciples who were not yet disciples of Jesus. This is one reason I said at verse 23, at the end of verse 23, when it says, strengthening the disciples, those were disciples of Jesus Christ. Now we're going to come and reintroduce Paul here at, verse, at uh, chapter 19, Acts. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. That's in Turkey. So Apollos went on to Greece, Paul is now still in, in Ephesus, because remember he went to Galatia and Phrygia to what? To strengthen the disciples that were there, where he had started church, he went to make sure they st were still on the right track. And as I said earlier, how do you strengthen? Well, you strengthen just like the, Jesus said, you sanctify through the word. Remember he said, Father, sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. So Paul Strengthening, how do you strengthen? Through the word. Paul went back to make sure in Galatia and Phrygia that they were still on the right track with the word being properly understood. So, Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Now, it's important to note here, if you'll go back to Acts 18, 19 through 21, Paul says, I have to get to Jerusalem, but I promise I'll come back and see you God willing. This right now is Paul fulfilling that promise to come back and visit them in Ephesus, in what we call today's Turkey. In verse 1 of chapter 19, Paul is fulfilling the promise he made in Acts 18, 19 through 21, when he promised them, I can't stay with you now. Remember, they begged him to stay. He says, no, I can't stay now. I must needs get to Jerusalem. Remember, he made that vow. He had to take the shorn hair and present it at the temple in Jerusalem. For those of you that are keeping up with these facts, I hope it's not too tedious for you. But now Paul is fulfilling that promise when he says, but I will return to you again, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. Well, now he's returning to Ephesus here in chapter 19 of Acts.
verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Right? Because he had been back to Galatia and uh, Phrygia. And finding some disciples, here is where the word disciples, I said pay attention, we were at the end of verse 23 of, of Acts 18. Now, finding some disciples, Paul assumes these disciples are Christians. Paul finds out by the very next phrase you can see that they are not Christians. Now why? Because Paul's gift of discernment realized something's missing. Thus today's title, you can tell when something's missing. Though they're groping correctly, they have the yearning, they want the Lord. They have all the Old Testament down, and they're anticipating and waiting for the pouring out of the Holy Ghost. What they don't know has already happened. But Paul can tell something is missing. And why do I say that? Before I read it, let me just say this. Where else do you see Paul ask any congregation this question? And uh, starting at um, the end of verse 1. And finding some disciples, he, Paul, said to them, Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Why would he ask that if it was evident that the Holy Ghost had been received by them? Clearly, he can tell something was missing. Let me explain this. First of all, your, old King, your, your classical King James will have since you believed but the original Greek has when you believe. And that is important to note because Paul is re-emphasizing everybody who properly uh, believes always instantly gets the Holy Ghost. You must pay attention to this subtlety here. Paul would not have to ask this question if it was evident and clear to him that they had the Holy Ghost. But he says, but when it says, and finding some disciples, they were disciples of John slash Apollos, not necessarily of Jesus. As again, I said, disciple only means learners or followers. Now, they were in the right direction. They, they, they had the right hearts, but they clearly, and they say themselves, we have not so much as heard whether there be Holy Ghost. We'll, Holy Ghost. We'll explain that in a minute because clearly they heard about the Holy Ghost. They were saying we didn't know that it had come. Well, listen to, and I want you to pay attention to this because things in this passage are very subtle. But this is what it, why it takes time and study to pay attention to notice these little, um, if not omissions, these little summary, the things that are summed up or assumed. And when I say assumed, through study. But once you study and dissect, you'll begin to understand, I believe. Listen to this. And finding some disciples, Paul, he, said to them, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? I know yours says since you believed in the classical King James. But again, the earliest Greek manuscript says when you believed. Because, as Jesus said, he who believes in me has passed from death. Let you receive it instantly. And Paul just backed that thought up, if you pay attention, by saying when you believe. Paul says, I know when you believe, everyone gets it. Now, here's what they answered. This shows you that they were not yet Christians. This shows you that they were disciples of John the Baptist. This shows you that they were limited. This shows you that something was missing. And Paul, with his gift of discernment, could clearly see what was missing. Paul could clearly probably say, I can see there's a lack of joy, or there's a lack of certainty, or there's a lack of sense of peace, or there's a lack, certainly, of power, because I don't sense that Holy Ghost." Power here, joy. Uh, saints, even with us today, this is not being self-righteous. I, a mere mortal like you, but the word is clear. People who do not manifest the fruit of the Spirit, it is clear that something is missing. When you don't have the forgiveness, the love, what does the Spirit produce? I want you to examine this. We like to sing that the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit? Of, what does that mean? Well, it means what the Spirit, when you have the Holy Ghost, what it makes you give, what it makes you show is love, forgiveness, long-suffering, and all the other fruit of the Spirit. That's what it means. When you have the Spirit, that's what it produces. When you hold grudges, when you're always ready to fight and you're angry and at your brothers and sisters in Christ, there's something missing. 
I would venture to say it's the Holy Ghost. You said, you can't tell me I don't have the Holy Ghost. I don't have to. The Bible says it is evident of those who have it. Didn't Jesus say a fruit can't produce what it doesn't produce? Uh, a tree can't, like an apple tree can't produce grapes. So if you have the spirit, you're going to produce what it is the spirit makes you produce. This is not like uh, uh, some preacher telling you you do or do not have the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells you. When you have the Holy Ghost, you bear fruit that show it. And you forgive your brother and sister. You love one another. You give a second chance. You're long-suffering because you know God has been long-suffering with you. There's no two ways about it. So when Paul says, have you received the Holy Ghost when you believed? Because what he could clearly be saying is something here is missing. And saints, I want you to examine that in your lives today. When you hear, for example, our dear sister Luberta passed. I'm seeing here Mother Della May George passed and Mother James passed. Penny, Jane, does your heart go out or does it only go out for people you like and know personally? I don't know everyone personally that I read, but my heart goes out for them at the instant I know they're Christian. And it goes out. Even more, if I know you personally, like I knew Lou Bertha was a fervent believer in the Lord Jesus. So it really, really touched me when she passed. Not that I'm sorry for her soul. I'm glad for her soul. And Mother Penny James, glad for their souls. And Mother Della May George, glad for her soul. And anyone else who passes on, anyone else who's suffering, if your heart doesn't go out, ask yourself, is there something missing in me? Am I a, a Christian in name only? Because... If you just can't get over grudges with saints, if you just can't get beyond personal feelings or things that happened years ago and personal bickerings, and where is that changing, that made over man or woman that the Holy Ghost does? Saints, I am, by the grace of God, currently or about to be, the age of our two predecessors in this particular organization. If I don't get it now, if you don't get it now, when? At 62 years of age, forgive me if I'm a little impatient sometimes with people who claim to be Christian and you just don't see the evidence in your, in a, in your, in your life daily. If not now, when? I mean, aren't you annoyed that something is missing? Because not only can we humans tell, God can easily tell when something is missing. But when the Holy Ghost is the most important thing to you and fellowship and union with your, with your brothers and sisters are the, most in, is the most in, are the most important things to you, you're going to manifest that with fruit of the Spirit. And no one will have to ask you, have you received the Holy Ghost when you believed? And you wouldn't have to answer like this. We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Ghost. Now, why did they say that? We just read that John's baptism preached that one is coming after me that shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So they knew of a Holy Ghost. Here's where you must understand the verbiage in the Bible. They weren't saying we never even heard, although it sounds like it based on the English here, it, we never even heard whether the Holy Ghost exists. No, what they were saying is we never heard whether it has come and been poured out. That's what they mean we have not heard so much as whether there is a Holy Ghost. Because to have heard of the baptism of John, they clearly would have heard, what are our three points again? They would have heard that you need to repent have a repentant heart. They would have heard you need to bear fruit worthy of repentance. They would have heard that one is coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with spirit and with fire. So they knew the Holy Ghost was coming. So clearly in verse two of Acts 19, they're not saying we never even heard of such a thing as the Holy Ghost. They're saying we never heard, Paul, whether this Holy Ghost has come and has been poured out. Has it been dispensed? When? Well, then Paul goes on to tell them, then uh, to ask them, first of all, then he said to them, verse three, into what then were you baptized? 
Paul, what is Paul, what is his obvious assumption? I thought you all were Christian. Then what were you, into what were you baptized? They answered, into, the, into John's baptism. Oh, says Paul, the limited uh, knowledge you have about God. Because it stopped at the baptism of John. Then Paul said, and here is where I said, Dr. Luke clearly gives a summation of this next clearly diatribe that Paul, you know Paul didn't leave it this, this, uh, this short. It says, here's where Paul, uh, Dr. Luke summarizes, verse, verse 4. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ, on Christ Jesus, the anointed Jesus. Now, clearly, that is Luke summarizing Paul, explaining to them the fullness of John's uh, preaching. Why do I say that? Because it is clear that Paul explained to them in depth all of what, as I just did, about what John's baptism means, John's message means, because after that, when they heard this, they were baptized, re-baptized, that is to say, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here again is another point I must make that the old school doted about words. There it says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It doesn't say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Clearly the understanding is in the name of the one Lord Jesus Christ. And when you dote about words, and the Bible says do not dote about words, but clearly you know what baptism you're taking on. You know with whom you're identifying. I'm identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what do you think the baptizing in water in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, as Jesus himself said, do, or right here in the name of the Lord Jesus, and another place in the name of the Lord, we know which Lord we're talking about, don't dote about words, and don't divide people, how are you, then you got to get baptized again. Now, some people ask, well, when I got baptized, and some people call it uh, the sprinkling, and some some actually go down in water, as many of us did. Some people say, well, shall I get baptized again? That's your, totally your prerogative. Because now that you understand, if you want to get baptized again, there's nothing wrong with that. But I know that when I went down, I did not understand as fully as I do now the notion of baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, to identify with Jesus Christ. I did not understand at nine what I know now. But the Lord knows my heart. But it is nothing wrong if someone wants to be rebaptized. But these people were only baptized into the baptism of repentance, into John's baptism. The Lord says you must be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost in to associate yourself with him, with the Lord Jesus. Now that we know all about this then, soon to come Messiah, he has now come. So the Lord Jesus in his great commission says go into all the world teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Peter tells us in Acts uh, 2.38. And here we have, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Clearly, your identification here is with the Lord Jesus. So submerge into water again, a symbol of identification. You did it once, you disciples of John the Baptist. Now do it again, because now that you've been explained that the one John was talking about has come and has gone away and left the Holy Ghost. And now to be associated with and a member in that body of the Lord Jesus, he himself said, identify with me before the whole world and go down in water and identify with me. Not any longer just the limited baptism and ministry of John the Baptist, good though it was. But John himself said, what I do and I myself am not worthy to compare to what's coming after me. That one shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with power. Now, what can H2O do after you've been baptized with the Holy Ghost and with power? Well, what you can do, not the water, what you can do is be obedient and go down in water as the Lord Jesus himself gave command that you go down in water. Now you're identifying with him. Now you're also showing obedience. 
Now you're linked to that one body of Christ. Just as John's submersion in water associated you with his ministry of uh, repentance. But repentance itself is not good enough. I thought you said when you repent, you get the Holy Ghost. You repent and believe in the Lord Jesus. At that time, the Holy Ghost comes. And we're going to see here, and this is where people also get this wrong. Well, oh, it's when Paul laid his hands on them. Paul gave them the Holy Ghost. Paul didn't give them anything. As no other human being, no man, mere mortal, gives you anything of saving. Only the Holy Ghost does it. Paul did it because you're going to see the two gifts or signs that came were for two groups of people. In this group, you had believing Jews and you had unbelieving Jews. And you're going to see here as we conclude that there was a need for the believing Jews to hear something and the unbelieving Jews to see and hear something. So Paul, accommodating this need, puts his hands on them because they as yet were unbelieving, if you will. And that's who was... Who are tongues always assigned to? In fact, we have it here in Scripture. Tongues are always assigned to the unbeliever. Tongue, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, the 14th chapter, 14.22. Tongues are designed for unbeliever, unbelievers, and prophesying is designed for believers. 1 Corinthians 14.22. Please, saints, remember that. So, when you see that the Lord gave two signs here, he was get, uh, addressing two groups of Jews that were here where Paul was. And don't forget, Paul asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost when you believe? They said, we have so much, not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost, meaning having come and been poured out. So when they heard Paul speak that John indeed baptized unto baptism of, of repentance, uh, saying that you should be baptized, but you should believe on the one who's coming after him, Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized, rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they did what? They spoke with tongues and prophesied. Again, why did this happen? Paul identified, because Paul was identifying them with the one body, the church, and also at Pentecost you had tongues for unbelievers, always a sign for unbelievers, and apostles were there. Paul's an apostle. He's showing you how similar you're just like the original church that got started. Paul was identifying them with it. That's why that happened. Paul didn't give them anything. When they believed correctly in Jesus, they had the Holy Ghost. And Paul was showing them that they had it. How did he show them? Hey, you unbelieving Jews, you speak in tongues, God was saying. And for those of you that do believe, prophesying means to expound on or open up the scriptures in power and truth. So some of them heard edification in the word, prophesying, and some of them received and heard and saw the sign of the tongues because you had two groups there. And Paul, addressing that, laid his hands on them to show them. And that's the same thing the laying on of hands always has meant. People tend to think that the human being does something. It's symbolic. It's also to assure you that you have the endorsement of the group and they laid their hands on them and sent them out. It's, 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 it's symbolic. Because saints, you have to agree with me. Only the Lord gives the power. Only the Lord washes away sins, not water. These things are symbolic. And the Lord uses symbolisms all throughout the scripture. And as we conclude here, let me read this last scripture before I go back and give you a quick review. Now the men were about 12 in all. That, you know, simply states that there were at least 12 males there to whom this happened. But it could have included also females and or children of a certain age of accountability. But when it says that, that's the way things were done then. Remember when they fed uh, the, the, the crowds, it says, and there were so many of them being men, which means if you add to the women and children, there were that many more that were there. When they came out of Egypt, they gave you the number of men that were there. Why was this done? When you see the Lord, you ask. But anyway, that is to conclude that particular uh, 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 passage that we're doing today. Let me review what I'm saying here today. You can always tell, even as Paul could tell then, we can even today, those of us that are blessed, I'm not saying I have every gift. Some of you have the gift of discernment. 
Some of you let the Holy Ghost use you where you can tell something's missing in this person. Not that you're to go around, sister, I perceive that you have, that's not, no. Because the Holy Ghost also gives you good sense not to go around offending people. But for those of us that have the Holy Ghost, for those of us that love the Lord and the union of his saints and love his people, I think it's pretty evident that most of us can oftentimes tell when something is missing. And I'm urging each of us today who claim to have the Holy Ghost, make certain that you do. Because when you have the Holy Spirit indwelt in you, and when you have it come upon you for power to do things, to say things, to discern things, you can sense when in you something is lacking and when in others something is lacking. And let us all pray together today that if anything is lacking, that the Lord may fill that need that we may all begin to produce fruit worthy of the Lord Jesus, that we may be his disciples in earnest, and in doing so, reflect him in the way we are in our daily lives, in the way we are with one another, and in the way we are with our reverence to him in all that we do. God bless each and every one of you. Continue to pray for one another that in this body of the Lord of the Lord Jesus there might be nothing that is missing God bless each and every one of you peace be unto you I'll talk to you soon Lord willing